For the past six months, the global economy has been under a lockdown because of coronavirus. And this week, the president initiated a first reopening of the Kenyan economy. Kwame Wino, who's the CEO of Institute of Economic Affairs, is here to help us contextualize the phase reopening and what it means for the Kenyan economy for the next six months. But before we get into the conversation, let's look at his profile. As I'd mentioned, his name is Kwame Wino. He is the CEO of the Institute uh, of Economic Affairs. Kwame is leading IEA's Kenya strategic intervention into the go-to think tank for sub-Saharan and the region. Kwame has led research and policy dialogue in economic regulation and competition policy. He has diverse interests in economic regulation, employment economics, and public sector forum. He also undertakes and oversees research in IEA Kenya's key policy areas on public expenditure and revenue analysis, international trade, economic regulation, devolution, and the use of future methodolo methodologies rather, to inform public affairs in Kenya. Kwame, thank you for making time. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, let's just begin by getting your two cents on what you make of the president's move to reopen uh, the economy, a phase reopening, as he called it, uh, this week on Monday. Uh, well, I think my, my reading of it is that uh, there's too much pressure on, 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 on government and the president to make the decision be open. Uh, so part of it was to say, look, these are not perfect conditions, but nevertheless, we understand the 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 pain and the pressure that farms had in terms of not being able to trade. Uh, some people were staying at home. And obviously, at the same time, I think that kind of fatigue was setting in. And we could see that uh, there were violations here and there across borders. People were crossing and all that. So as a matter of fact, part of it was informed by fine conditions are a little better. They're not perfect. But I think we need to reopen anyway so as to, <laughs> to, to prevent further damage. 6th of April, the president ordered a cessation of movement in and out of Nairobi and Mombasa just to kind of control and contain the spread of coronavirus across the country. And that was one of the areas where he ordered for the lifting of the cessation of movement. What do you think will be the impact of that move? Well, I don't know because I'm sure that uh, the, the idea about this was obviously Nairobi, Mombasa and some parts of Mandera had become hotspots in the sense that there was very fast growth of, uh, of, of infections, at least according to the tests. And so there was a need to curb them to ensure that uh, you slow down the growth of the, of the infection. So after two months and a bit, I mean, almost three months, then obviously a, a big revision has been made. So there must be some decision that was made that says, look, uh, we think we now have a handle. We have testing equipment available. We have expanded hospitals, facilities and all that. So I think among the things that will happen is if the testing keeps going on, then we'll see definitely more 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 infections. But uh, but the confidence I think is that the president says, look, we have uh, um, asked all county governments to prepare medical equipment. We've asked them to prepare medical spaces, so it's possible that we might not be overwhelmed. But as he said, is that if uh, infections become too, I mean, go ahead too fast, then in another month or so there might be a, um, a reversal in the sense that obviously there might be a reduction in uh, um, in the restrictions. I mean, the, the restrictions might return, might be returned, yeah. yeah. Front, because Nairobi is considered the economic hub of the country and also coast is the uh, tourism hub of the country. And these are two critical areas in the economy. Well, uh, for Nairobi, um, I think it's clear but that even with the opening, not everybody's going to go back quickly. So if you start about something that Nairobi and Mombasa share, obviously the, diff the profile of business people is different, but Mombasa and Nairobi have a lot of uh, hospitality establishments. I don't think people are rushing back to start to, to take up holidays and hotels. Mombasa is also dependent not only on local tourism, but tourism from around the region, but also from international flights. So for as long as international flights have not resumed, and other countries as well have their own uh, problems with managing the, the, the spread, then obviously it will be much, much slower. Uh, Nairobi is far more diversified, I think. So obviously you can see people who work, some manufacturing farms already uh, pushing people back into work and all that. So that will happen. So, But my point is it's going to take a little bit longer because I, th I think the president also advised uh, that Kenyans should know that we are not out of the... Uh, out of the red yet, I think uh, the danger of getting infected and the possibility of uh, mass spread is still there. Yeah. And I like the fact that you've talked about international flights. Let's bring in aviation into the conversation. And I just want to bring in some statistics briefly. According to the latest report by African Airline Association, Africa's aviation industry recorded a 90.3% year-on-year passenger traffic reduction for the month of May. 
And KQ CEO uh, Alan Kilavuka said they had lost an estimated 1 billion shillings in revenue due to COVID-19 pandemic and related lockdown. Now, the aviation sector has been operating cargo, but uh, people has been very low. So what do you make? Do you think the government's move to lift the ban on both domestic and international flights will go a long way in jumpstarting the sector? I mean, I think it's a, as soon as, I mean, uh, aviation is in trouble. Um, uh, let's remember that domestically and actually on the African continent, most, especially the passenger travel part, most uh, airline companies were doing very poorly. Uh, so obviously what happened with the, with the COVID-19 emergency was actually made a bad situation much, much worse. And that includes everybody, including Kenya, with, uh, with the exception, of course, Ethiopian Airlines, but also uh, given that it had to slow down operations, that already has happened. So the sooner that it's, it's, it's opened, the better for them. But of course, aviation and international travel depends on all economies doing well at the same time. But as we know, refund imf father is that this this year is going to be there's going to be a global recession and actually the global economy is going to contract by about four percent those are not good numbers for for the aviation industry but nevertheless they need to open so that at least they can get some operations going on yeah when you say economies are going to contract by four percent and it's not good numbers it means that the aviation sector might be still in the red and uh they could not it will be difficult for them to recover. What are some of the things that they can do to inject vibrancy back into their sector and encourage people to go back to traveling and not just traveling, but use air instead? Well, I think air and travel is a... Uh... Is, 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 a, is a niche, I mean, it's a niche, um, of course, in other parts of the world, not yet, but in Africa, obviously, the kind of people who travel, travel either for business, those who travel for leisure tend to be higher income people. Now, for as long as the recession, I mean, for, for as long as this um, uh, uh, global problem, uh, recession exists, and what that means is that incomes are not available. Airlines need to carry people between points, and on both sides, they need, uh, they need, they need um, uh, passengers. So for as long as uh, it's slow, I think airlines have, the decisions that are actually uh, difficult decisions that the, the managers have made. One of them is to reduce the number of flights, um, partly because obviously it's expensive to keep a, uh, a plane on the ground. But now what you have to do is you you, you ensure that you do not run other costs uh, separately. So obviously some of them have cut down on the number of flights. They're trying to get uh, more frequent uh, travel, but obviously that too is dependent on. The point I'm making is for as long as the underlying economics foundations and not good. The airline industry will actually just be trying to, 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 to keep themselves alive. I mean, keeping the engines running every so often. But many of them have actually shut down. In some cases, uh, as much as a third of the fleets that some airlines have in the Middle East and even in Australia and Singapore have been kept apart for the time being. And they are, they are, they are watching. As the economy recovers, obviously, they'll be able to go forward. But this moment has been used to either um, uh, refurbish their premises, at the same time retrain their pilots. But on the whole, many people have, have actually just been kept um, um, uh, on the, in abeyance, waiting for conditions to improve. So it depends on so many other things. And that's a problem about the airline industry because it just doesn't depend on the domestic conditions in one country. You'd have to require the entire globe to recover. So if the big economies don't recover soon enough, then obviously airlines will have a much tighter time. So my view is that maybe uh, another quarter before we can see them revving all those engines and trying to, 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 to get all those flights back goes hand in hand with tourism and according to statistics by the ministry of tourism even if we reopened and domestic and international tourism resumed in july the month that we are in only about eight hundred thousand tourists will visit the country that means we are about a million down from the 2.5 tour 2.5 million tourists that we had last year what should the tourism ministry do to jumpstart travel in the country because as is people are not traveling hotels are operating under 25 percent capacity that the reason the, the airlines were closed uh, or air, i mean air travel was closed just like other forms of travel was because of this virus that it spread for as long as we don't have uh, a clear view about where the spread is what's the level of of infection throughout the country for as long as people will fear that I have to go make a queue go into a flight and breathing in air, in and out, I might, I might get contamination. That would be. So I think that the point lies in actually winning the medical side. If we win the medical side by giving Kenyans impression, look, we are continuing to test, we've raised the test, and it's clear that the disease pattern is such that we have a handle of it. People will travel. I mean, those who need to make business journeys will have to make them. Those who need to make uh, uh, journeys of leisure, if they're not saving their money for a rainy day, we'll see that, look, it's clear. Uh, prices are much, much better as a signal. Then obviously people 
It might help as well. I don't know how much, but it might help as well if Kenya says, look, uh, given the, the, and I think Tanzania has tried the same, given the conditions globally, if you come in right now, visa charges will be slashed or some kind of incentive for people to actually reduce their costs. That would be helpful as well. But the most important thing is we, um, at the national level, we must have a handle on the spread of the disease. If we do that, that's a perfect signal for people to continue to travel. And uh, what you've just mentioned on visa and incentives works very well for international tourists. But how do we reorganize the domestic tourism market so that we can also tap into that potential? Well, I think the domestic tourism market, if you, if you, if you consider what some of the um, I mean, local operators have been talking about, was actually something they've been working on to develop. So it all depends again on the recovery. I mean, there's obviously, as you remember, many countries, many, many, many companies, because they had a supply side and demand side shock, had closed down their premises. I think this is the time to get people back in and part of part, part of getting people back in. They understand it better than they do. It's usually to give offers to, to allow for people to pay over time and to try and uh, make the best of the holidays. But for while physical distancing and, and, and is still necessary, I think the, the hospitality industry will, will definitely still have a, a problem because they tend to, some, some, some enterprises require people to actually come in mass. Of course, there are niche providers of, 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 of tourism experiences in the Mara and some other parts of this country. Those might not because if you have a small, um, rather if you have a facility that is very exclusive and people pay in advance and you have a, um, a waiting list of two years, I'm sure right now that would not be a problem for as long as you can travel, a small facility that takes 10 or 20 people at a time, they probably are not as suffering as much as, as the others that require a much bigger mass. Okay, now the people who travel are the people who have been facing the economic repercussions of coronavirus. Most of them, let's say the middle income, they've lost their jobs, some have taken pay cuts, and this just means that it's going to be more difficult for them to find money in their budgets to spend on leisure. And let me just bring in some statistics here. Data from the World Bank shows that in 2019, Kenya had a labor force participation of 75%. However, this rate fell to 56.8% in 2020, that's April, and at least 1 million Kenya have lost their jobs. Now, the president's aim of reopening was also to ask Kenyans to go back to work, to reopen their businesses. But what more needs to be done to ensure that even as these Kenyans go back to reopening their businesses, the businesses can stay afloat? Um, well, I think the biggest one was the, 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 the stimulus that uh, the cabinet secretary announced. Obviously, many businesses had suffered because they had a shock on both sides. Your supply shock in the sense that you you not supply because people have, people can come to work. If you're running an enterprise where you need, uh, say, 50 people, you cannot run them all at the same time. But on the other side as well, because people were not working, people were not buying many things except for food and very essential items. Now, for that to open, some of them have had machinery lying idle and some of them were unable to get their, their supplies from, from, from whichever. You, you're importing things from South Africa or from India because some... Uh, there were delays to reopen that very very quickly would be a useful one uh, i mean would be would be useful so getting uh, the logistics at the port working for instance would be useful globally as well to get uh, ships moving as well to to convey goods would definitely useful i think um, for horticulture industry which also suffered but had, had started a recovery i think to maintain the cargo flights between kenya and, and and other parts of the world is definitely useful so there are many things that need to be done all at once but coming down coming back down to to kenyans local businesses some had to close because they didn't have money to keep their their uh, workers in place so this uh, uh, fund that was made available for them I think needs to be rolled out very, very quickly so that those who are able to start to refurbish their businesses and to get back their workers should do that. So a lot of things need to happen, but the most important one is to make sure that people have money. And of course, the lending uh, takes place so that they're able to, to, to start putting their business in order uh, as, as quickly as possible. Yes, just like everybody else, I think the country needs a very quick recovery and the less time wasted, the better. And uh, manufacturing is also a sector that is bound to suffer and the suffering is predicted to come in the second half of the year because many Kenyans have lost their sources of income and it's predicted that about 50% of them have lost their purchasing power and will have to weigh options before purchasing. How can the manufacturing sector cushion themselves from the shock that's about to hit them? Well, I think they've done well, um, all factors considered. One of the things you saw is that the manufacturing sector in Kenya showed that they're they are resilient in the sense that uh, we see in the news every day, courtesy of uh, business programs such as this, that manufacturing sector um, farms are moving 
from uh, products that were not going um, in that that did not have immediate demand and decided to manufacture um, other products that are necessary for medical care. So they went into PPE suits, they went into manufacturing ventilators, they went into uh, manufacturing medical equipment and all that. So they're that kind of resilience and that kind of uh, quick um, shifting is part of what many of them do. I think some, there's some business lines that would take much longer to recover, but if they've seen what has happened, that look, we can go into, if you're a textile farm, but you're now going into making aprons or making PP suits, then obviously uh, that's, a new, that's a new area. So to keep the workforce in place, I think is very, very important. And part of that is why uh, uh, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers itself is encouraging its 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 its, um, its its membership to look at what opportunities have arisen together with the the, the fact that we have manufacturing farms that that make and process food will not have as much uh, of a problem because one of the things that people will do, irrespective of what happens, is obviously people will preserve their income to be able to buy their uh, buy their buy, buy their food. So that's a um, that that's useful for the others. I think it'll just have to be everybody has to wait. Um, or rather, everybody cannot wait for the economy to recover quickly. So part of it is domestically what we do, but also the global lines opening up uh, and demand um, um, coming up will also, will also be useful. So we cross our fingers in both ways. If the globe opens up sooner than later, and the figures show that, um, I mean, the IMF suggestions suggest that it will not happen for at least another seven months. I mean, for until the end of this year, that's bad. But for those who can, actually, we'll just scale down operations to make the most uh, basic things and make sure that they can keep their farms running. Yeah. And uh, you've talked about the global economy reopening. And uh, statistics show that Kenya's economy is not doing so well and it has taken a big hit because of COVID-19. McKinsey and company have placed growth expectations at 1.9% in their recent report analyzing the impact of the virus in Africa and the latest World Bank Kenya economic update predicts a growth percentage of 1.5%. However, Treasury maintains it at 2.5%. What are your growth projections for the second half of 2020? Okay, first, uh, we at the IEA don't make a uh projections, but we use some of those projections to see whether one is realistic or not. Uh, my view was that at, at the beginning of the year, when, I mean, or rather, uh, at the time when the, the cabinet secretary presented the budget uh, and looking at what the history had been and how far uh, the devastation that had taken place, I think it's clear that uh, two and a half might be very optimistic. It's not impossible, very optimistic given the circumstances. Farms were not able to, 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 to work. Uh, so it, there was both a supply and a demand side shock. When all those converge, it's a very, very difficult problem for economies to, 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 to wade through. Uh, so it was clear to us that the 6.2 at the beginning of the year that was not going to be recovered. The central bank itself had uh, suggested at the end of March that it would be 2.3. Treasury seems to think that it's much, much better. We are not seeing anything so far based on the figures. I mean, what has been released for the first quarter, of course, we are waiting to see the, the data for the second quarter, that actually is going to get much, much better. Um, if the reopening happens and if a quick um, uh, recovery takes place, it will depend on whether whether the disease is controlled very quickly. It's not evident to us right now that it is, and so two and a half seems to be more uh, very uh, very optimistic in our view at this moment. Uh, maybe two and the 1.9 uh, would be possible, and I hope there's no second shock because if a second shock takes place, then it's possible uh, that we might be going to uh, about one percent, which would be really really bad because it's also just even below. Um, it's below uh, population growth, which means actually income. That will mean more trouble, let's say, for example, for the budget, because we have a budget of about 2.7 trillion and a 7.5% deficit of the GDP of the financial year 2020, 2021, and it's coronavirus, locust, and flooding. And this just means that coronavirus has been 100% disruptive, both to the government front and to the private sector front. What do we do differently? in the next six months to ensure that we can be able to get some revenue into the basket to even cut for a bit of the budget? Okay, I think what government has done well, which is uh, basically, I mean, towards the, towards the, in the preparation of the budget is to make some modest assumptions. So I think the scaling of the revenue is predicated on the fact, look, the shock will be big, but uh, we are thinking about the same revenues as what was had last year. So it, there's not been an, an but of course, they're spending enlarged, which means that there's a big spending uh, deficit, as you've mentioned. Uh, there'll be a lot of borrowing from the from the from the markets and also from um, government partners, bilateral partners, many of whom have made commitments to help government to to wade through this. So it's just basically that 
My view about I mean, rather our view of the Institute of Economic Affairs is that the contents of the locusts, the rains that are being delayed, of course, and the floods, then we have COVID-19, was such a bad one. Uh, and its pains are going to be felt much, much more because public finances were not in a good place. I think if you look at it, already we had big deficits, I think mean, the amount of money that's being paid out for, for public, uh, uh, public debt, extremely high. So obviously we, Kenya was in a condition of debt distress. Then all these come, so it's going to be a really, really tough time. But I think uh, the way to do it is actually to stop mega projects right now for the time being. Those big infrastructure projects that government liked and that has been going on for seven years, I think it's time to take a freeze on them so that you can manage basic things. Um, and if there are any savings thereafter, obviously then to, to, to use it for, for it. But for the most important thing now is that for this year, most of what government needs to do is to actually just hold everything together. Finally, Kwame, in about 30 seconds, um, uh, when you listen to medical practitioners, the Ministry of Health said we could reach our peak in August, but some doctors dispute that and said the peak could be in December or January. It's very difficult to predict the disease patterns in the country. And also globally, it's difficult to predict the patterns because we thought the United States was reaching its peak and then it's, it's more like a second wave or the disease burden is on the rise again. What does this mean for Kenya's economy in the next six months? bearing in mind that we have reopened? I mean, I think it's going to be a roller coaster. Uh, but the way to actually do it is my view is that uh, there are many things that the Ministry of Health have done well. The one thing they haven't done well is their disclosures about what the assumptions of the model that they use to suggest when the peak would be is. Because in, in, in February and March, or sorry, in, in April and May, we, we had this view that the next two weeks are going to be the most important. And yes, there was an escalation in infections, but it wasn't so bad. But so often right now, we are already in the 200s per day, but we are not too sure what their expectations about when the peak will be. So for as long as there's not um, complete disclosure, I think it's going to be a roller coaster. And even business people are saying, fine, we have to go back up there. But they don't know whether in, a, in, in two or three weeks, they're going to have to tell their staff to actually stay back home again because it will not be safe for them to travel. So I think that's the uncertainty that people need to press the Ministry of Health to actually tell us, what does the epidemiological model that you're using say? And is it telling us that even if we open, yes, uh, infections will go up, but after some time, they're going to go down within this time range so that people can plan. Yeah, so that uncertainty, I think, is going to stay with us for a while. And it's not good for... for for economic um, uh, growth, certainly. Well, thank you. That's where we leave it. Thank you very much for making time. Thank you very much, too. Okay, there you have it. Kenya's economy is tied to the global economy. And for as long as the global economy remains uncertain, Kenya's economy will remain uncertain. Equally, if we do not have predictable patterns of the disease, the economy is tied to health and there's no other way around it. It's either we find a way through it or uncertainty keeps lagging. And that means that business will stay uncertain and we might not meet the targets that we want to reach. And maybe the reopening might be in vain because remember the president said in 21 days, if the situation does not improve, we'll go back to lockdown with zero options that's where we leave this conversation but always know you can be a part of it metropole debrief is a dialogue so log online at Ganga at metropole tv the hashtag to use is metropole debrief what do you make of the face reopening and do you think it will serve a big role in jump starting the economy and putting food back on the table of kenyans we take a short breather we'll see you shortly